Welcome, everybody, and thank you for coming to this talk. Um, it was planned that Carl Cower from Unity uh, to share this talk, but uh, he can make it, and uh, I would like to apologize in his behalf. Um, but I promise that I will feed you today with uh, uh, very useful info for uh, your games. And here is the, the agenda for, for this talk. Um, I will first uh, go very fast through um, how we ported our latest demo, Ice Cave, um, to uh, Samsung Gear VR. And, uh, and then I will um, start talking about the main, uh, the main points of the talk, which are related uh, with several uh, highly, um, <coughs> highly optimized effects that you can uh, use in your VR games. Um, and finally, I will talk about uh, how to implement stereo reflection in Unity, which is something that I uh, just finished last week and uh, uh, I'm sure will be interesting for you because Unity can provide uh, directly, directly uh, stereo reflections. Um, so uh, as you saw in the, at the beginning of, of the talk, uh, my name is Roberto and uh, I'm a software engineer uh, in the ecosystem in our. So let's, um, let's talk about the iScape demo. Probably some of you already attended our booth and, and could see the demo. So our iScape demo, the latest demo, was presented uh, last, uh, last, uh, last, uh, last unite in uh, Amsterdam last year. Um, and after that, in, in uh, in summer, we decided to uh, port the demo to Samsung Gear VR. Uh, but before talking about our experience in porting the demo to Gear VR, I would like to show you uh, a short video about the demo. An abandoned cave, home to an ancient lunar calendar, used at one point in time as a site for celebration. In the distant past, people would climb the mountain up to the glacier cave, and after paying their respects, rotate the statues of the zodiac animals around the calendar board. No one has visited the cave for thousands of years, but the spirit of the past is still alive. So I hope you enjoy the, 
the video. Thank you, thank you. Um, okay. Um, so now that we are um, more familiar with uh, the ice cave, I would like just to go very briefly about some highlights of uh, the work um, we did for porting the, the demo to, uh, to Gear VR, to Samsung Gear VR. Um, at the moment when we decided to go for a Via VR version of this demo, there were two options. Um, the Oculus plugin, the, uh, using uh, the plugin approach, using the Oculus uh, Mobile SDK, or the native support, the, build, the built-in uh, native uh, VR that was just released at that time with the uh, Unity version 5.1. As the, uh, as the plugin uh, approach had several inconveniences, we decided to go for the uh, native support, despite the fact that uh, at that moment there were uh, several problems, uh, several unsolved problems. Uh, but we were uh, confident that uh, sooner or later those problems will be solved, and, and that will be the best way to achieve the, the best performance, which is a key point to guarantee uh, in VR a successful experience to the user. Uh, so we uh, went for uh, the native support. At that time, we started uh, with a 5.1 um, version of Unity. <coughs> um, as you know, for when you when we are uh, you are wor uh, working with a native support, this is really simple because you just need to get the device ID, then go to uh, Oculus website, get the signature file. Place in, place in the in the right folder, um, check the virtual reality supported option, and, and build your application. And that's all you need to um, um, get your VR version of any uh, game or um, uh, application you got in, in Unity. Uh, we did, we followed those steps, and this is what we got at the beginning, just black, black screen. Uh, the point is that our original uh, demo was using a custom resolution, and uh, in, Unity, in, in VR you can't use a custom resolution, not so far. Uh, I remember that, that, at, that uh, at that point it was really useful to uh, use the um, uh, Gear VR developer mode, so you can enable uh, in your phone the Gear VR developer mode, and then you can run your application without inserting in the, in the Gear VR headset. Uh, especially at the beginning when you are just trying and, and making a lot of, uh, a lot of um, um, tests, so it is very useful. Um, so uh, we solved the problem uh, and we got our uh, demo running in VR, but that was just the start of the job because, because the original demo, there were several uh, features of the demo that weren't uh, too um, VR friendly. For example, the original UI based in a couple of um, virtual joysticks we removed. We um, um, implemented a sim very simple UI with a um, Samsung Gear VR touchpad. Uh, we removed also the camera. Th there was a um, the full camera animation mode, but uh, the user got sick uh, during the animation, so we removed the animation. We carefully uh, set the speed of the camera when moving uh, through the ice cave. Um, um, because uh, several people, for several people, just a little fast, so they got sick again. So we uh, um, carefully set the camera speed. It was really important to guarantee uh, a successful experience for the user. We want the user, the first time they try uh, VR, to, to, to have a pleasant experience. Um, uh, originally, this cave was designed big, so the user can go through the cave, explore several parts, part of it, and uh, um, they don't feel claustrophobic. This is also something important for, for VR. Uh, the original demo has the, a dirty effect, uh, dirty lens effect implemented, but for some reason in VR, it didn't work fine, so we remove it. Um, also, in the original demo, the user were able to go through the geometry to look at the cave from the outside, but in VR, it's completely um, bad experience, so we implement the camera collision and sliding uh, but we uh, don't allow uh, the user to, to go outside, of course, because it breaks the, the experience, the VR experience. Um, 
We also implemented uh, the streaming of, of, of the content of, the, of, uh, uh, of what the user is actually seeing in, in the Gear VR to uh, another device, to a big screen, to show to the other people what this user is actually seeing. Um, probably some of you uh, uh, approach our booth and, uh, and could see that. Um, many, many, many people always ask how we implemented that. Uh, the guy which is there in the, in the picture is, was uh, my student. Uh, he was working with us for uh, eight weeks in summer. And uh, yeah, he implemented that. Uh, with his help, we implemented this. Um, and what we did, um, if you try to just uh, stream the, the, the full, the full uh, frame buffer, it's just unthinkable. Uh, what we do is we, we are running the VR application on the headset and we are running a non-VR version of this application in a second device. And we just stream every frame, camera position and camera orientation. Six floats. This is all you need to replicate the camera motion in, in the, in the uh, non-VR application. Uh, many, many people try to, you know, to stream the, full, the full, full frame buffer. You don't need to do that. I mean, we are working with a mobile device where we need to carefully balance all the resources. Uh, all, all the runtime resources. Um, so we implemented, uh, uh, my student also implemented uh, an alternative UI using a mini Bluetooth controller and it worked very fine. So you can do um, you know, several stuff to improve your VR uh, and the user interface. Uh, <clears throat> and let's go now to the, to the good part of the talk where you can, uh, you can take uh, some real stuff that you can use in your uh, VR games or applications. Um, when we are working uh, in VR, uh, we are um, pushing the hardware to the extreme uh, because we need to render every frame twice. We um, issue the draw call twice, we bind our texture twice, we uh, fetch our, uh, we uh, render, um, we draw our me uh, our mesh twice too. So the, the, we push the hardware uh, to the limit. Uh, and uh, this is the reason why it is so important in VR to use highly optimized rendering techniques if we want to achieve high quality uh, VR uh, visual content. And this is, I'm sure, all we want to do that. So in the, in the uh, VR version uh, of our uh, demo, we have developed very opt uh, highly optimized rendering techniques based on local queue maps. Um, I'm talking about shadows based on local queue maps, uh, refractions and reflections, all of them based on local queue maps. The shadow techniques has been specially designed for the, um, the demo and it is a, a new technique for rendering shadows. So I will explain the details in just a minute. But I would like to introduce the con first the concept of local queue maps. For some for some of you, uh, maybe uh, it is not a new concept. But I would like to introduce this, the concept uh, of local queue map, independent of the application you do from it. So <clears throat> let's assume we got some. Uh, scene which is uh, delimited by an arbitrary um, uh, by an arbitrary shape, by an arbitrary uh, uh, boundary. And uh, we bake our queue map from some point inside of this uh, uh, volume of the scene. We bake our queue map uh, for that point. And uh, we are looking from our camera uh, from to some point of the scene, for example, to the start. We are looking in the direction of the vector v. The question is, what is the vector we need to use to fetch the texture from the cube map to get that star, which is in the direction of the vector v? This is the problem we need to solve to use the local cube maps. If we use diagonally to fetch a texture from the cube map, the vector v, we will get something else, but not the, not the star. We will get some smiley face which is pointing in the direction of the vector v. So let's think about a little about this problem and try to solve it. So 
it is uh, logically uh, the vector we need to use, the origin of that vector, is in the, the place where we bake the cube map, in the origin of the cube map, right? And the second point to define the direction of the vector will be in the star position. But how we find the position of the star? We don't know the position of the star. We can find that position by finding the intersection point of the vector V with our boundary. But our boundary is an arbitrary boundary. So we need to simplify that problem. We need to introduce a kind of proxy geometry that simplifies the problem of finding the intersection point of our vector with that proxy geometry. And the simplest proxy geometry we can introduce is just a box, the bounding box of our scene. The finding the intersection of a vector with a box is just a couple of uh, instructions. And if the vector, if the origin of the vector is inside of the box, it's even simpler. And this is the case. We are inside of the scene. So we find the intersection point of uh, the vector with uh, our proxy geometry, and we build a new vector from the position where the cube was generated to that intersection point. And then we use that vector to fetch the texture from the cube map. And only then we will get the star when fetching the texture. We call that process local correction. You can find in some books uh, some parallax correction, but I don't know why. There is no parallax effect. We are applying some correction to correctly fetch the texture from the cube map. We call that local correction. So if you look at this, I mean, from this perspective, and I'm trying to introduce the concept of local cube map independently of the application we do uh, with this, we can say that the local cube map is something more complex than the simple cube map we know. It is formed by the local cube map, but you need to know the cube map position, and you need to know the scene bounding box, and you need to apply a local correction. And at some point, the standard cube map is just a simple case of that formulation. The standard cube map, the local cube map will be exactly equal to the local cube map only when the bounding box of the scene is very large. Okay, and this is the case when we are dealing with, a, for example, reflection from the sky box or whatever. We, we just use that vector and fetch the texture and we will get the, sky, the, the texture from the sky box correctly. But if we are baking our cube map to be using some local uh, conditions, then we need to apply it, the local correction to whatever vector we use to fetch the texture from the cube map. We can bake in the cube map any information. We can bake in the cube map in the RGB channel, the uh, color of the scene. We can bake in the cube map some information in the alpha channel. I will explain that. And uh, we can bake in the cube map, for example, the depth, whatever you want. But when you are fetching the whatever you save there in the local cube map, any vector, you need to apply the local correction, OK? This is important to understand. And then it will be easy to understand uh, the three uh, rendering techniques I will explain, which are based on local cube maps. And I will start from, from shadows. Shadows uh, in mobile devices are expensive. We need to carefully balance uh, runtime uh, resources in mobile devices, and shadows are expensive. But in VR, shadows are particularly a performance killer. In many VR applications, you just can't afford shadows because they are expensive and they are twice expensive in, in, in VR because many resources are devoted to render twice your scene. And I will, we uh, develop a new rendering technique, a new shadow rendering techniques in our team. Uh, and I will explain now. It is a real, really simple and uh, the techniques works in two stages. During the first stage, which is offline, you bake in the alpha channel of the cube map 
the transparency of this of your scene. So if we got here in this room those doors, the doors are open and we can see through the doors, and we render our Kuma from the uh, middle of the room, we will render in the alpha channel of the cube map the transparency of the scene. Is if when rendering a world pixel, the geometry is opaque, we will write there one. And if the geometry is totally transparent or there is no geometry, we will render zero. Just this is what we do in at the, uh, in the generation stage. At this point, we don't use any information about light position or the number of light. So this method will be independent of the uh, number of lights and will be independent of the light position. The only requirement is that the light should be outside of our volume delimited by the scene bounding box. And let's see what we do at runtime. So at runtime, in the vertex shader, we build a vector from the vertex to the light source. And we pass that vector as a varying to the fragment shader in such a way that in our fragment shader, we get that vector interpolated. And in the fragment shader, we, we, we got the vector from the fragment to the light position. And now we will use that vector to fetch the texture from the cube map to know what is there stored in the alpha channel. But, but as, a, as I told you before, if we want to use that any vector to fetch a texture in, for, uh, from the local cube map, we need to apply the local correction to that vector. We need first to find the intersection point of that vector, of the fragment to light vector, with our proxy geometry. Once we find that intersection point, we build a new vector from the position where the cube map was generated to the intersection point. And then we use that vector to fetch the texture from the cube map. We are interested only in the value of the alpha channel. If when fetching the texture, we got zero, it means that in the direction of the fragment to light vector, the geometry is totally transparent or, of, or there is no geometry. It means the light can reach that fragment and that fragment is lit. If in the direction of the vector we fetch uh, one, it means that in that direction the geometry is opaque. So the light can't reach that fragment and that fragment will be in shadows. That's all. It's really, the implementation is really simple. I'm not giving here the source code, but Below you can read, source code is the ARM guide for Unity developers. If you go there, you download the guide, it's free, and you will see the source code, the code snippet that you just can copy and put in your shaders and that will work. This, this, um, this new technique can also produce soft shadows. And I will explain now how we can uh, produce the show, soft shadows based on this technique. Instead of fetching the texture from uh, the zero level min map of the texture, when we bake our Q map, we also build the Q map min maps. And at runtime, when fetching the texture, we are not fetching anymore from the zero level uh, min map. We interpolate between min maps and we blur our texture. So there is a function text cube lot that allow you to fetch the texture and interpolate between two consecutive min maps. And we, for that, we need, you just need to indicate a parameter. And we pass to that function a parameter which is proportional to the distance from the fragment to the intersection point in such a way that the farther away is the fragment to the intersection point, from the intersection point, you get that, uh, uh, that uh, texture more blur. And this is what is in the, in the image. And I'm showing you here, the light source is changing automatically the vector from the fragment, from the vertex to the uh, light position is updated and, and we get our, uh, the, sh the shadows uh, accordingly to the new position of the light. 
in the right, we are changing the parameter. We are passing for fetch, fetching the texture from the, uh, from the QMAP and we, we can um, uh, reproduce the softness of the shadows. We can make the, the shadows more blur, more soft, or hard shadows. You can see there, no? Sorry. But there is a question, okay, our QMAP is static. We bake the QMAP beforehand, offline. What happened if in our scene we've got object, dynamic objects that change the position or the shapes or whatever? So that QMAP will no longer, no, no longer be valid. It means that we can bake the QMAP again. Sometimes you can afford baking the QMAP at one time, because you don't have to bake the QMAP at once. You can bake several phases of the QMAPs, and you can smartly, smart you choose, but normally not. It is expensive, of course, to render a QMAP at one time. But we can decide what we uh, put in that QMAP. So in such a way that if we got a geometry which is a static, and in, in, uh, in Unity, we got that checkbox static geometry. So we, up, we applied, we uh, bake in our QMAP only the static uh, geometry. We will use this method that I just explained to produce the shadows from only from the static geometry. And for the dynamic geometry, we just use the standard shadow mapping technique and at one time in our shader we can combine both types of geometry to produce the shadows. So in such a way that we obtain a single picture of the shadows from our scene. And this is what we do in our demo. In our demo we got shadows which are coming from the cave. The cave has two big ho uh, holes at the, at the entrance and also at the top. So when the light is coming, uh, those holes produce shadows. The holes of the cave are static, so we are rendering the shadow from the holes uh, using this technique. And there are other objects which are dynamic, which are change their position or um, um, uh, in the scene. So we just use the standard shadow mapping technique and we render to a texture uh, every frame the shadows uh, from those objects and we combine uh, in the uh, same shader and we got uh, the picture, uh, the whole picture of shadows. What I, what I uh, need to say uh, at this point is that this technique, uh, the shadows uh, that, produce, uh, that produces this technique are perfect. If you are dealing with a shadow mapping technique, you know that texture is changing from frame to frame and we also, you also uh, always get uh, pixel shimmering or uh, instability, pixel instability, uh, in the, uh, especially in the border of the shadow to light. Uh, but this is something that this technique, in this technique you won't find because we are fetching the texture all the way from the same cube map and our shadows are just perfect. So this, this technique can be applied not only because it is efficient, but also because the quality is really high and could be used not only for mobile devices, also for, um, for desktop computer, where the resources are infinite, but the quality of the shadow mapping is not, is not too good. And we can improve also the shadows using this technique. So let's see now uh, the refraction effect, which is uh, the effect you can see, uh, one of the effects you also can see in our demo. We have developed also ref uh, refractions, um, um, uh, we render also refractions using a technique based on local cube maps. Uh, and I will show you how we do that. So again, just refresh uh, the concept of refraction. Refraction is, is, is just the bending of the light when the, when the beam light passes from one medium to another with a uh, that has a different um, um, refraction index. So the light, the light bends and uh, uh, but the, the, the important thing is that you got a built-in function in our shader to find the refraction vector, which is the refract function, 
you need to provide to the refract function the view vector, normalize uh, the normal uh, of the refractive surface, and also the relationship between the refractive uh, indices. Uh, so we got there uh, some refractive surface, and uh, our um, view vector is, uh, is bended in the direction of the normal, uh, and uh, we have baked in our, uh, in our volume, in our scene, a Q map, a local Q map, but this time we, we, ha we are rendering in the local Q map in the RGB channel the scene. Um, and we want to use the refraction vector to fetch the texture from the Q map to see what is behind our object in the direction, in the, in the direction of the refraction vector. But as I told before, we can't use directly the refraction vector to fetch the texture from the cube map. We first need to apply the local correction to that vector. So we need to find the intersection of the refraction vector with the proxy geometry. Once we get the intersection, we build a new vector from the position where the cube map was generated to the intersection point, and then we use only. Only then we use that vector, that new vector, to fetch the texture from the cube map to find what is behind that object. In the, in, the, in the refraction direction. And this is what is, is, is in, the, in the picture. <clears throat> Using that technique, we can have this kind of effect, this kind of nice effect, and, it's, and the cost is only one fetch of the texture. And of course, it gives you life to your game. It gives you high quality of, of your, to your graphics in your game and a, at a very low cost, which is the most important thing. We got quality at a very low cost. And uh, I left intentionally the reflections to the end because I also, I will, uh, I will talk about how to implement reflections based on local queue maps, but also at the end I will talk about how to implement stereo reflections. Which it is something that I just finished last week. It is something that Unity is not giving you, and it is something that you need to use if you, are in, if you want to build correctly your winter wall. So let's see um, how we implement reflection based on local QMAP. Here I have to say that the, the concept of local QMAP was introduced um, specifically to implement reflections. It was in 2004, and for some reason, when I started research the local cube maps, I was wondering why it took so much, it took so long from 2004 to just a few years ago, the big engine started to introduce the local cube map techniques. Do you know the, um, Reflection prop in Unity, have you used that? Reflection yeah, reflection prop, yeah. But reflection prop is, 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 is reflection based on local cube maps. When reflection prop was introduced in Unity 5, it was a couple of years ago, or one or something. And it, this technique is available from 2004. So in 2004, this technique was introduced for the first time. At that time, uh, the author was, let me check, because I, uh, Kevin Borg used, instead of a bounding box, as a proxy geometry, a bounding sphere. Bounding sphere is more complicated to find the intersection of the vector with the bounding sphere. It's, 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 you need more, more, more instructions. Uh, it's more expensive. And in 2010, a guy, and I don't, don't, I don't know the name, uh, from, you can, you can follow the, the link there, in, at, in game dev, there is a, just a thread, and the guy proposed that method. And uh, it was in 2010. And in any way, it took maybe two or three years more for the engine to understand what is happening there, what we can do with that. Uh, <clears throat> and so the principle is again the same. We find our, we, we got our view vector, 
we find our uh, reflection vector using the built-in function reflect, reflect. We just need to provide the view vector, the normal to, uh, of the, uh, to the reflected uh, surface. And again, we can't use diagonally the reflection vector to fetch the texture of the cube map. In our cube map, we have uh, baked the scene in the RGB channels. But again, it is a local cube map. We can't use directly the reflection vector to fetch the texture and see what is in the, ref in the direction of the reflected vector. We need to apply first the local correction. So we need to find the intersection point of the reflection vector with the proxy geometry, with our uh, scene bounding box, and then build a new vector from the position where the cube was generated to that intersection point. And only then we can use that new vector to fetch the texture from the cube map and this will give us what is in the reflection direction. It, it was already known from 2004. For some reason, it took some time to us developers to realize uh, the advantage of this method. And again, you can find, you can implement reflections using this method, but if something changed in the scene, that cube map won't be valid anymore, at least for those objects which are dynamics. But we do the same as, as I uh, explained when dealing with reflection, with shadows. We use, um, for example, for reflections coming from a distant environment, only in that case we can use the cube map directly using the reflection vector. Because the environment that is reflected is so far that is no matter. You don't need to apply a local correction because you're, it's like uh, you are working in a local environment with infinite bounding box. So you can apply this uh, method of local cube map to render your reflections uh, from the geometry which is static. And from the geometry which, uh, that is dynamic, you can use, for example, uh, for, for the planar reflection, you can use the method of the um, mirror camera that render to a texture every frame your reflections. And you can combine all these type of reflections in a single shader and get a single reflection picture of your uh, scene. And this is what we got, for example, in the platform, in the center platform in our demo. In that plot, uh, you can uh, see in the platform the reflections coming from the sky, the reflections coming from the walls of the cave, which are static, and the reflection coming from objects, which are dynamics. So, um, and we use different type of, uh, we, we render the ref each reflection uh, with a different technique. For reflection coming from a distant environment, we just use the cube map but we don't apply any local correction. We just use the reflection vector to fetch a texture from the cube map. For the geometry, which is uh, static, we use the local cube map technique. And for the uh, geometry, for, for the dynamic geometry, we just render the reflection every frame. And we combine all these reflection in a single picture. But the point is that when, when you are uh, rendering your reflections to a texture, right now in Unity, you, Unity will apply the same texture to both eyes in such a way that your reflection is not stereo. And if your user is there, you know, immersed in your environment, and your eye will spot it really fast, very easy, that something is wrong there in that reflection, because it doesn't fit. It's, 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 uh, I would like to show you that, but it's, it's not possible because you need to check that, uh, for example, in the gear we are using it in, in, in stereo. Um, so right now, Unity um, doesn't offer the, this option. Uh, last, last week, I um, succeeded in implementing that because it was something that uh, I understand that it is important if we want to keep our user uh, with a sensation of full immersion in our environment, we need to build correctly in, from every point of view 
our uh, virtual world, and reflections are part of it. So how we can implement that in Unity? First, you need to add a couple of uh, cameras. Each camera will uh, targeting uh, a different eye. You need to disable the camera because we will handle manually the render of, the, of those cameras. And we need to create a target where those cameras will render to the reflections. And we need to attach then uh, the script which is there to each camera in the on pre render function and in on post render function. In on pre render function, there is a, will be a setup camera function that will place the camera and orient the camera correctly to render the reflections, starting from the information of where the main camera is located, of course. As we are rendering object upside down, we need to um, inverse the winding of our geometry. And after we render in the post, on post render function, we re revert our winding. So we attach that uh, um, script to each camera. For, ev for uh, each camera, the setup camera function will be a little different because you need to apply, you need to um, uh, build correctly the view matrix, the projection matrix, and once you build the view matrix, you need to shift in the X axis your camera by half of the distance of the eye separation distance for one camera to the left, for the other camera to the right. Yeah, yeah. And uh, in the, um, and in the main camera, you need to attach this script which is there. Three minutes more. And uh, what, the, uh, what this script does, there is a on pre-render function and this script will, call, will be called twice. When the main camera is rendering the left eyes and when the main camera is rendering the, the right eyes. And it's called first for the left eyes. I check that. And when it is rendered the left, the left eyes, which is the first, the first time this function is called, we will call from, that, from, that, from there and, and we will call the rendering of the left reflection camera. And after that, once the reflection camera rendered to the texture, we, we will pass that, the texture to our shader. The second time this function is called by Unity will be called for the right eye of the main camera. Again, we call then, in the second part of this script, the render of the right reflection camera and the, ref the reflection camera rendered to texture and we pass, we update in our shader that texture. And we control, this is, there is an eye index, we just control and the eye ind index get the value 0, 1, 0, 1, 0, 1 every time just to know which eye is rendering in uh, every pass. In such a way, when I was implementing that, the, the, the main problem was I'm, am I synchronized with the main, with the main camera in, in my shader? So I just did it, the following test. I passed to the, to the shader as a uniform, the eye, some eye index, and I say, okay, if, you, if, if the main camera is rendering the left eye, I will use a, some red texture, and it, when rendering the right eyes, I will use some green texture. And this is the picture taken from the, from the device. So where it is an unstable picture, there is no flickering, nothing. So we are totally synchronized with the left and right eye of the main camera. Then we can use just a single texture for the left and the right reflection camera because we are just synchronizing. First the, first, the left camera will render to a texture, the reflection from the left, um, from, for the left eye, and then in the, in the following pass, the same, uh, the, the right reflection camera will render to the same texture and will update the same texture, but it will update, it will uh, update the texture accordingly and well synchronized with the main camera. And uh, 
yeah, it, it's not possible to show here. Um, you need just to you know, uh, um, use the, the, uh, the headset to, to see, uh, but it is the only way you can get uh, your virtual world correctly when you're working with reflections. Uh, just to wrap up what we've seen uh, so far, um, with the built-in uh, native support to, you, uh, to VR, Unity um, has made a great contribution to democratization of, of VR. It is really easy to, uh, to implement VR in Unity. Uh, from the point of view of mobile devices, it is a, a big boost for mobile devices because the player is no longer limited to the, to the screen size of the mobile phone. Now the player is embedded in the virtual world where there is no frontier, there is no boundaries. Uh, <clears throat> with this demo, uh, we show that it is possible to achieve high, quali high visual quality in mobile devices in VR if we use appropriately our uh, rendering techniques, if they are um, optimized enough for that. So, uh, and I will really encourage you to uh, download our uh, ARM guide for Unity developers where you will be able to find there the source code of all, all these techniques. And you can download the source code, copy, paste, and put in your shaders, and you will be able to get these nice reflections, refractions, and shadows. That's all, guys. Um,